Jim, so are you. Nice to see some new folks here. Where's our book club from Charleston? It's good. Yay! 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 That's wonderful. Welcome, y'all. I'm Jonathan Alp. I'm the executive director of Pat Conroy Literary Center. This is one of the Conroy Center's Visiting Writers series events, and in fact, our last Visiting Writers series event uh, for this calendar year. It's a delight to have Wiley Cash and Jason Mott with us here. Uh, before I introduce them, I first want to thank just the couple of folks who make this possible. First of all, the Technical College of the Low Country, who makes this space freely available to us for this program and so many others. And uh, our series has been funded this year by both South Carolina Humanities and by the Pulpwood Queens, the largest book club in the United States. Any Pulpwood Queens members here? Let's pretend that there were. Camera, cameras on us. There were a bunch of them here. It was amazing. Nice of them to show up. <laughs> so let me introduce these folks, and then we're going to have a little conversation. And our hope is, uh, by the end of our conversation, we'll actually get to have uh, you involved in that conversation as well. So we're definitely going to hold some time for a Q&A. So that's your warning to have questions ready when we're ready for you. Next to me here is Wiley Cash, New York Times bestselling author of the novels Land More Kind Than Home, This Dark Road to Mercy, and most recently, The Last Ballad, a historical novel of the life of Ella Mae Wiggins, the mother of the protest ballad and martyr to the labor movement. Wiley was awarded the Sir Walter Raleigh Award for Fiction for The Last Ballad. He is also the founder of the Open Canon Book Club, which we'll ask him about a little bit later, and co-founder of the Land More Kind Appalachian Artist Retreat. He also serves as the writer in residence at UNC Asheville. And for the next um, oh, 40 minutes, whatever we're up here, my interior monologue is just going to be don't tell him that he has 1990s Rick Bragg hair. Do not tell him that he has 1990s Rick Bragg hair. I've got 2018 Charles Fraser hair. You do, actually. <laughs> yeah. I got to talk to Charles recently, too. I might mention that. Uh, and on the end, in our anchor spot here, New York Times and USA Today bestselling author Jason Mott is the writer in residence at UNC Wilmington. He's the author of two poetry co collections, excuse me, We Call This Thing Between Us Love and Hide Behind Me. He is also the author of three novels, most recently the dystopian novel The Crossing, which we'll be talking about today. Jason's debut novel, um, The Returned, has been published internationally in 13 languages, and was adapted by Brad Pitt's production company, Plan B, and aired for two seasons on ABC as the TV series Resurrection. His second novel, The Wonder of All Things, is now in film development at Lionsgate. Jason was nominated for a Pushcart Prize in 2009, and Entertainment Weekly listed him as one of their 10 new Hollywood Next Wave people to watch. So please welcome Wiley and Jason. Now, you may be wondering what a historical novel and a dystopian novel have in common, and that's my job as a moderator to build those bridges, but I think there are actually quite a few. Uh, it was not a difficult task to do, because uh, as, as I read them, I see both novels as being very much about familial love, the power of memory, both personal memory and cultural memory in, in the bigger sense, uh, what it means to forget or to be forgotten, and ultimately, both are very much about the role and responsibility of the individual to, uh, to community and to society on a much larger scale as well. And maybe, because it's the Christmas season and we're weirdly surrounded by a giant presents, uh, <laughs> we might also talk about how these, these stories, in their way, arc toward a sort of hopefulness. Uh, whether or not they get there is another matter, but there's a certain uh, momentum toward that. So let's start with you, Mr. Cash and talk a little bit about The Last Ballad. And in the interest of full disclosure, you and I got to do this once before in Nashville. And I don't want to necessarily reiterate all of that conversation, but just to, to set up some groundwork for this, you are from Gastonia, and that is where the novel takes place. But this is a part of the history of, of your town, the place you grew up in, that you did not know uh, while you were growing up. So you tell us a little bit about how you came to know the story of Ella Mae Wiggins and the Lorraine Mill Strike. Sure. I, uh, I, was, I was raised in Gastonia, um, born in, in 1996 there, and um, some of y'all just took uh -huh. that. Doing the math, you're thinking, God, he looks fantastic to be so old. Um, 
But my family, uh, my dad was from a mill village over in Shelby, which is the next county over in Cleveland County, next county to the west. And my mom was from a mill village in Gastonia. All my, my, my grandparents <clears throat> had grown up on farms in the western part of the state and had seen the promise of the mills as, as the way they were going to get ahead and kind of get out of this cycle of seasons and poverty and, and tenant farming and all this stuff. And um, my parents grew up in the mills thinking, oh, we've got to get out of here, you know. And so they saw the suburbs. Like, once we get to the suburbs, that means we've made it. We've made it. And so I still live in the suburbs, and I'm thinking, gosh, what's my next frontier? And so I think in, in me writing a novel about uh, this migration from the hills to the mills, I was trying to go back and reclaim something that felt authentic. My life in the suburbs doesn't feel very authentic. Like, I live in one of those neighborhoods. Jason doesn't live too far from me. He lives a more authentic life than I do. But I live in one of those neighborhoods where, like, all the yards are chemically green except for mine. And, like, in the, the garages, like, the dads purposely leave their garage doors open so you can see how clean they are. And they've got, like, flat screen TVs in their garages. And I'm like, where do I live? Like, they're all decorated perfectly for Christmas. And my, my girls, like, we drive to the neighborhood and put their face up against the glass. Like, somebody who loves their children lives in that house. Like, I love you. I'm just busy. Sit down. Um, but so, so I grew up in, the, in, the, in this mill town without a real awareness of the mills. I was aware there had been mills. I was aware that the mills were being turned into apartments or storage facilities. Um, and when I went to graduate school in Louisiana, I told someone, one of the professors asked where I was from. I said, I'm from Gastonia, North Carolina. And I'm used to saying it's between Charlotte and Asheville. There's a clothing cloth outlet there, all these different things. And he said, oh, home of the Lori Mill Strike. And I was, it like took me aback that anybody had heard of Gastonia, first of all. And second of all, had some kind of historical context to lay, lay on that. And I was also embarrassed because I had no idea what he was talking about. It was like the first week of school. And so I said, yeah, everybody, everybody knows about that. So I Googled it. Or this was in 2003. I probably Yahooed or dogpiled it or whatever the search engine was at that time. And discovered that one of the most significant labor movements in American history had happened in my hometown. Uh, the woman who was the martyr of the movement was, had the same last name as my mother. Uh, my grandfather was 22 years old at the time. This strike happened just a few miles from the mill where he worked. It made headlines in every major newspaper around the world when it happened. And just as soon as it was over, history literally swallowed it up and kind of buried it. And I was really interested in how that could have happened and how, how that secret could have been kept from me. And so when I felt that I was a competent enough writer and novelist, I tried to tackle that project, and that was this novel. And, and how did you find your way to sort of centering around Ella Mae Wiggins as the central figure of the novel? I knew that her struggle was going to be the heartbeat of the book. I knew it was going to be the psychological, emotional thrust of the book. Uh, she was also a real person, so I felt like her carrying the emotional burden of the novel felt like it was in the best service of history, of the story. But I had a hard time. You know, she was a real person. We know the facts of her life. She was born in 1900. She died in 1929. She gave birth to this many children. This many children died from poverty. She worked in these mills at about this time. Um, but we don't, we don't know a lot about her. And I really struggled creating her as a character because she was real. And so what I found myself doing was creating other characters uh, and then watching them as Ella passed through their lives and how they reacted to her. Did she outsmart them? Did she out-tough them? Did she out-love them? And once I saw how they responded to her, she became just incredibly real to me. And so I kind of wrote her character in relief of the others. But then once I, I was able to see her through their eyes, she really came to the fore and was able to carry the novel in the way that I'd always hoped she would be. Jason, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the protagonist of your novel too. Ella Mae Wiggins' story is that she gets lost to time, she gets forgotten, and your novel is very much about memory in many ways. Uh, on, the, on the small scale, you have uh, at the heart of this two twins, Virginia and Tommy, and Virginia has this amazing ability, very much like her mother had, to remember everything. She's in this sort of cloud of memory where every moment of her life is happening in addition to the moment that she's in. But in the large scale of nature of the world they're occupying, there's been what you refer to as the disease going on for 10 years now. 
and it is it is killing off the aging population and it's moving you know the the age range that it's affecting is getting younger and younger so in many ways the world is losing its memory it's losing the voice of experience and wisdom uh that comes from those folks who are being removed as well so how did you come up with this concept uh for the novel what 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 anxieties are you working through in all of this um there's tons of anxieties being worked through in that novel um it, it started i guess if all of my writing is somehow usually rooted in mythology and folklore um, I was that kid growing up who spent way too much time reading books about Greek mythology and Norse mythology and African mythology and like anything mythological, like I just devoured it. Same thing with superstition and local folklore, you know, all those like legends, like it just it kind of encapsulated me in my entire life. Um, and so once I grew up and just started writing novels, um, you know, I kind of shifted into magical realism, high concept, whatever you want to call it. But to me, it's all about skirting that, that world of myth and folklore and that place where amazing things kind of happen. Um, and so I went into this. All I knew from the beginning was that I wanted to write, you know, I wanted to, one, write through a lot of my anxieties about the world, you know, um, you know, climate change, politics, like wars. Like, it seems as if everything is just going really south and really quickly right now. Um, and, of course, like so many other people, I am really anxious about that. Like, you know, regardless of where you sit politically, I think everyone is anxious about something right now. We're all just in this really tightened emotional space. Um, and so I needed to write that out. And so I said, oh, well, you know, let me take this and push it forward. Like, take some of these fears I have and some things that the news are, is talking about and, like, all these elements and push them forward and say, okay, what if all these things we're afraid of slowly begin coming to fruition? Like, what does that world look like? Um, so that created the world in which the characters were going to exist in. Um, but the challenge still became to create the characters themselves. And so I knew I wanted to have a brother and sister protagonist. Um, just because I love, you know, I have two older sisters who used to beat me up as a kid, so it's finally a chance to get back at them. Um, <laughs> but I also, you know, I'm big on relationships. Like, all of my stories eventually boil down, boil down to relationships. Um, and so I created Tommy and Virginia being twins, and the, myth the mythological aspect that I kind of threw into it was this idea that, you know, being twins, being binaries, you know, in mythology of any kind, the binaries are almost always opposites. Um, and so I kind of started this idea that Virginia remembers everything and Tommy tends to forget almost everything. And what is that? And so I took that and I pondered that for about, you know, a few months just trying to really imagine what that might really look like and like what that might really feel like. Um, and initially it seemed like, oh, it'd be cool to be able to remember everything. And then I realized, like, when you stretch that theory out long enough, it becomes a really horrible burden to be able to remember every single moment of every single day because you're perpetually caught up in your highs and your lows, like they're there, it's just as real as this current moment is. And for Tommy and Virginia, you know, they're both of their parents died in a terrible car crash. And so for, for Virginia, the moment of that car crash is always with her every single day and every single moment. And her brother Tommy, however, has all but forgotten it. Like he barely remembers, you know, his memory is essentially carried in Virginia. She carries the, the burden of remembering their family's strife and terror. And Virginia kind of resents Tommy for it. And so. It was, it was fun for me just to take these, you know, what began as just a small kind of, you know, what if it suddenly expanded out into this really intricate and complicated, you know, theory, you know, just thought process of what it means to remember and what it means to forget. And, and to, to pick up on what you said about them being uh, opposites, Virginia is very cerebral, Tommy is very physical, it plays out in, in a, on, a, on a number of levels with them as well, uh, which is uh, really interesting to sort of see them play off each other. But very much the way that Wiley's novel is set up, you see them most strongly when they're interacting against or with other characters. They, they go on this road trip, and, and I'll um, uh, let you explain why when I ask you uh, the next question. But they encounter a number of characters. They sort of move in and out of the custody of these folks, all of whom seem to have stories uh, as well. So Virginia is sort of collecting other people's stories as she goes, which uh, has a nice payoff in the end, too. But I'd love for you to talk about um, how this world that they are in is reacting to the disease, what, what's going on as a result of that. Because I, I found it fascinating, all the different things that sort of happen when, when you know the world's coming, and, it's, and you've known it for 10 years, so what's, what's the state of the world? Yeah, um, the state of the world is pretty, is pretty chaotic. Like, everyone is truly living the carpe diem lifestyle. Like, everyone is trying to figure out what it means. You know, they, they, everyone is realizing the fact that, yes, it all is possibly ending now which is that extension of my fears. Like, what if we are living in this time where, you know, because at the time of the writing, you know, North Korea was being crazy, er, than usual. Um, and, you know, everything was just kind of really tense. And I was like, well, you know, what would it mean to really be afraid? Like, 
you know, we're afraid, but we're not changing our lives right now for, you know, out of this fear. But so what if the world was truly and genuinely, like, seeing the end coming? How does that, what does that look like? Um, and so in my brain, it, it plays out as, like, people begin really living the version of life that they want. Like, there are extravagant parties, which is one kind of extreme, like, what people are doing. The other extreme is just people kind of getting close with their families and, you know, finding those connections. Um, and so as Tommy and Virginia, so the reason they're kind of traveling across country is they're going from Oklahoma, if I'm not mistaken, down to Florida to Cape Canaveral to watch a shuttle launch. And it's one of the last, they, we get a sense that it's one of the last big positive actions that the world is kind of, you know, or the country at least is kind of doing, where they're sending this um, shuttle to one of the moons of Jupiter called Europa. Um, and it's been theorized, and this is true real life stuff, um, that Europa actually has an ocean underneath the surface of ice. And there's a big strong theory right now that if there was anywhere in our solar system to sustain life, it would be under, in this ocean on Europa. Um, and so in the story, there's this uh, shuttle launch going to Europa to kind of you know, begin drilling and hopefully try to find life. And Virginia wants to be there to see it. Like She knows that you know it's going to be years before it gets there, and who knows what the world will be like by then. So she's desperate to get there, and she kind of drags Tommy along. Um, now, the other side of why they're going also is that Tommy has just been drafted to the military, um, you know, things are, you know, the war, there's a war happening, it's gotten so bad that they're, they've reinstated the draft. So, the, so they're both, this is their last trip together, and that's the reason that they're going. Um, but as they do travel along, they meet a lot of people, and Virginia does become this, this keeper of memory. Um, there's this one scene where, you know, not, no, not a big spoiler, but there's a, there's a great scene, or I think it's a great scene, um, where Virginia encounters this woman who used to be an opera singer. Opera singer and once she's, once Virginia, you know, she finds out that Virginia remembers everything. Like, there's a scene where she comes into, you know, Virginia enters into the house and just passes through the living room, and Tommy tries to convince the woman that Virginia can remember everything. The woman says, prove it. And without looking back, Virginia names everything that's in the living room, exactly where it's located, like every single finite detail she's able to remember just from memory. And once the old woman um, realizes this, she goes into the living room and she turns on her uh, record player and music begins playing, and she just belts out this very beautiful aria. And she's doing it just because it's a way of, pres like, she knows that Virginia will always remember it as a way of preserving this thing that she cared about so much. Um, so Virginia becomes this proxy by which people are, you know, giving her their memories whether they want to or not. And that, that idea of memory and what it means to hold on to this twilight of humanity, in a sense, moves forward through the novel. Yeah, that scene with Maggie, the opera singer, is just incredible. So I'm glad you mentioned that. It's on my list of questions, so you're, you're getting ahead of me. Um, and it also makes a nice bridge back to you, Mr. Cash, who have also written about a singer. So meanwhile, in the world of 1929, the world is on the cusp of monumental change as well. But it's a possibility of an optimistic change with the coming of the, of the labor movement. And as you said, Ella May is in this sort of quantifiable reality of poverty. She's making $9 a week. She's got, uh, what, five kids at home, get nine, four have now passed away because of uh, poverty-related illness. And, and there's just no way she's going to get by unless the system changes. The, the system is not going to help her, so it needs to change. And she, too, gets, gets uh, brought into this world where she can play a part in that. She can have a role in that. So can you talk a little bit about sort of how LMA, the real LMA and, and the character LMA, get, get involved in the labor movement? Yeah, sure. So Ella is, when the novel opens, she's working at this mill called American Mill Number no. 2 in Bessemer City, North Carolina. It's seven miles to the uh, west of Gastonia. And she's working 72 hours a week on the night shift, and she makes $9 a week, and she's literally working herself to death. She's lost some children. In the novel, I have her losing one. In real life, she lost four. I just thought that contemporary readers wouldn't know how to respond to a, a, a person who's lost four children and their ability to get out of bed in the morning and continue their lives. Um, but you know something has to change, and she discovers a, a union leaflet that circulates through the mill, and it's lists the union's demands, and the demands are things like a $20 minimum wage, and she earns nine. A 40-hour work week, she works 72. Recognition of the union, equal pay for equal work. She knows there are men in the mill working the same job she's working, getting paid way more than she's getting paid. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that anymore, right? That's something that's, that's passed since 1929. There's no un unjust practice like that going on, not today. Um, but these are, by, by today's standards, pretty, you know, small, you know, sensible sensible demands. We think, of course, you should not have to work 72 hours. Of course, you should earn more than $9. Of course, you should live in sanitary housing when it's provided by a company. But the unions just said, no, no. 
because unemployment was so high, it's 1929, we're on the eve of the Great Depression. World War I has ended. Uh, in the years before the war, people left the farms, they left the mountains, and they went down to the mills because the mills sent people up into the hills, and they said, come down to the mill. We'll give you a church. We'll give you a house. We'll give you a school. We'll give you a store. We'll give you a job. We'll give you everything you could ever want. Or you could stay here in this lumber camp, or you could stay on this farm, but the mills were at set, and people came down in mass. So by 1929, unemployment skyrocketed, wages had fallen, but the financial stability of the mills had never waned. Um, production had stayed high, uh, mill gross or intake, whatever, had, had stayed high, but wages had fallen. And so Ella decides to join the strike she learns about at Loray. And one of the ways she gets involved, both in my book and in real life, is she begins singing at the, at the rallies. She grew up in the mountains of East Tennessee, singing uh, when she and her mother would do uh, laundry. They would, they would do, uh, do laundry around the campfire. And she grew up singing old mountain ballads. And so when she gets down to Gastonia, she starts recasting these melodies and inserting contemporary song lyrics. Um, Woody Guthrie called her the mother of the protest ballad. Pete Seeger ended up recording some of her music. Um, so she had a foundational impact on American protest singing. And if you're all familiar with the magazine Oxford American, they just released the North Carolina music issue. And they asked me to write about LMA. And I asked my friend Shannon Whitworth, who used to be in a band called um, uh, The Biscuit Burners. Her husband's actually Woody Platt, lead singer of Steep Canyon Rangers. I asked Shannon if she would record Ella's song, Mill Mother's Lament, that Pete Seeger actually recorded on his Industrial Ballads album. And Shannon recorded Ella's song. So if you want to hear this song, how I think Ella probably sang it, you can get the Oxford Americans New North Carolina music issue, and it's song number 20 uh, on there. That, that just came out, right? just came out. Yeah, that's fantastic. Why is no one writing songs for you? <laughs> They're just writing movies for TV, yeah. TV shows. For TV. It's TV shows. You know, it's a tough life. Yeah. It is. It's tough. Um, there's another commonality between these novels that I want to touch on, and, and that's uh, there are letters from other family members in both of them, too. In, in Jason's novel, uh, the, the kids, Virginia and Tommy, their father was a writer, and we get to learn a little bit about that, but more often than not, we get to hear it in his voice because he's written these letters to these kids uh, that we encounter in a really nice sequence as well. How did you come up with uh, the need to have this voice and then that is the solution as, as the way we would hear that voice? Um, the need for it kind of it, it fit the theme of you know memory and sustaining you know, you know kind of keeping the past, and so you know the father decides he wants to write these letters to his to his children to kind of you know recount what was happening, um, but that really that sprung out of my own kind of catharsis. Again, writers are always writing about themselves, believe it or not. Um, so we're all egotistic, you know, narcissists. So. <laughs> I wanted to write my, some of my fears. Like I've got you know, three wonderful nieces, two nephews. Um, my girlfriend has two, two children, a five-year-old and, and you know, younger one. Is like, and, we, and I thought to myself, you know, again, playing out this idea that the world really gets to be a, in a terrible position. Like, how do you answer to them like, how things, you know, when your when you're small, small child grows up and they're you know, 17, 18, and they're asking you, how did the world get this way? Like, how, how did it get so bad? Like, what happened? You know, what answer do we, you know, do I give to them? How do I say, like, yeah, I saw climate change coming, and I didn't do much about it, and I, you know, I still drive a gas guzzling car, and, like, you know, how do you express all of this? Um, so the, the letters begin as the father's way, because in the novel, the father sees the disease kind of starting to occur, and, like, the war is starting to occur. Like, it's very concrete that the things are going, you know, south pretty quickly. And so for his own kind of catharsis, he begins writing these letters to his children, just explaining the fact that like it wasn't any one big thing that happened. It was just the day to day, like, you know, today this thing changed by one degree and you know, a month later something else changed by one degree. And he kind of tries to not make excuses, but just explain explain the way that, you know, it's never the one big thing that changes the world, it's the million small things that slowly affects it. And you wake up one day and you realize it's all changed and maybe it's even too late sometimes. Um, and so he, he he, in the novel, he's kind of realized this, and he wants to write about that and talk to his children about the fact that, you know, they were always trying to do the best they could, but it just kind of got away from everyone all of a sudden. And, you know, and he knows that they have to grow up in this world that is not the way he remembered it being, the way it was when he was around. Um, so, that again, that was the character's kind of catharsis, but it was also my, my kind of writing about that and my trying to sort through 
you know, how do I answer those questions when, you know, my niece who's 13 now, like the, you know, when I was 13, the world was, you know, very different. We still had this conflict, you know, there's always been conflict and strife and things of that matter. But, you know, we had polarized caps. We had all kinds of things that, you know, will not be there. When she gets to be my age, she will exist in a very different landscape and a very different, you know, political landscape. You know, all those things will be very different for her. And in my opinion, in my opinion, they're going to be much more difficult than they were for me. And so how do I, you know, how do I talk about that with her? How do I kind of start that conversation to say, when she asked, you know, well, what did you do to kind of prevent this? Like, it's a hard question. So the character kind of writes about that. And he does so beautifully. Uh, those letters, I think, were, were just an incredible asset to the book. And it, it really helps establish the tone for the novel, too. This is not a race against time, let's get the MacGuffin to the space shuttle and save the world kind of novel. This is a, you know, we can't do anything about it. We're living through it. We're experiencing it in this way. And I thought that was, that the letters really add to that so nicely. You also have this other uh, sort of narrative element, too, these uh, moments where the, the narrative goes elsewhere, as you say, where we get little glimpses into what's going on just on sort of the periphery of the novel, of, of the main narrative of the novel as well. How did you decide to add, add those elements to it? Um, those have become, somehow they've become trademarks of like my writing style, which I never, ever intended, which goes back to my, the, you know, the return, my, the first novel that got published. Um, when I finished that novel, it was you know, one big mass. It didn't have any kind of um, vignettes or small pieces between sections. And I found an agent, got lucky and found an agent, and her and I were talking about this one character. There was just one character in the novel who appeared very briefly. And my agent said, you know, I love this character so much, but he gets buried in the big section here. Can we pull him out and maybe give him some space on his own to kind of exist and so we really get to see him? Um, and so I thought about it. I was like, okay, cool. And she was like, well, there are, you know, two or three other characters who show up very briefly and, like, they have great story, but they're buried, so can we pull those out? And so before I knew it, I had, you know, all these small, like, two, three-page vignettes between chapters, um, and I really enjoyed writing it. It let me touch base with my poetry background. In addition to doing fiction, it kind of blended two together in a really fun way. Um, so I did that for The Return, and then I did it again for The Wonder of All Things. And without even really, like, thinking about it, I had done it again for the next book. And I worked on a book, I'm booking another book right now, and I'm probably going to do it again. Um, so it just, but it, 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 not to say that I have ADHD, like, I, I'm pretty focused. But I do like to, because... As much as I love focusing on characters and you know, riding along closely with characters and seeing how they exist, I always wonder, you know, what about the world beyond? Like, what about what's happening elsewhere in this world? And since I do try to typically do stories in which the, you know, big things are happening kind of everywhere, how do you encompass that? How do you touch base with that? And so my method has been to, you know, use these vignettes to kind of explore other people and how they're reacting to the same dramas that our main characters are. Because we all counter, encounter things differently. We all respond differently to them. And so I love to kind of portray the fact that, like, everyone acts differently in some in similar situations, so. And that's very similar to the structure of your novel, too, because, you said, as you said earlier, Ella is sort of the central thread through this tapestry of other characters who interact with her in different ways. But the, the letter that I want you to, to talk about, the letters, I should say, are the ones uh, from Lily, who's trying to explain uh, her mother, Ella, to, to a nephew. Uh, how did you come up with that, that framework for it? Now, Lily is not based on Ella's a real daughter. She's a Not really. construct of yeah. your imagination. She's pretty much a construct. Ella had, had an older daughter named Myrtle, um, who was, I think, 13 at the time of the strike. I have Lily being 11 at the time of the strike. I think, I think that's right, unless I haven't switched. Um, but similar to what Jason was saying, I wanted a voice from the past. Lily's writing these letters in 2005. She's, I think she's 86 years old. And, I want, and she's writing to her nephew and saying, you know, I never told you who my mother was. Your father never told you who his mother was because we were ashamed. We were ashamed of being Ella's children because we were taught that she uh, lived among black people. We were taught that she was a single mother. We were taught that she was political and that those were things to be ashamed of. And what this 86-year-old woman does is she takes this account of her life. And there's a moment when she has to, to come to terms with the fact that she's ashamed of the shame that other people have put on her. And it's something that we're all going to deal with at one time or another. You know, I ask my, my parents sometimes, like, historical questions, like, hey, what sit-ins in Greensboro? What, what, were you, what, were you, what were you doing during the sit-ins in Greensboro? Oh, I don't remember. You know, uh, what were you doing in so-and-so? Oh, your dad was stationed in Germany. We were over there just trying to live. 
you know, we're always asking this for a historical accounting and where were you and how were you involved and what did you say or what did you not say? And so I think, similar to what Jason said, his father in his novels, you know, tracking this stuff, but you're also sometimes trying to say, I was there and I did this, but I didn't do this. Um, and so I think it's something we all, we all think about, especially if we have children or young people in our lives. What kind of world are we leaving for them? Are we making things better? Are we making things worse? Uh, uh, how, how are we going to, do, going to account for those things? So. Sort of a look for, looking for accountability, right? Sure. Sort of, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and another thing, this is, uh, I guess, a more anecdotal, colorful answer. I read Gail Godwin's novel, Flora. Has anybody read that novel, Flora? Yeah, Sandra read. Uh, that's like, that's probably one of the best novels I've ever read in my entire life. And I just think Gail Godwin is a national treasure. And I thought, I want to write a character who talks like Gail Godwin. And so I, I created Lily and kind of channeled Gail Godwin's voice. Well, given that you're writing about a real person and real, real um, events, what, what sort of accountability do you feel to the past when you write a historical novel? Are those barriers to you? Or That's a great question. You know, um, I think that this is the first, I mean, I guess all my novels have been historical to a certain degree. Landmark High takes place in the 80s. It's very much a novel of the 80s. I'm very much a child of the 80s. It's about kind of religiosity, religiosity run amok. I was raised in the age of the televangelist Jim and Tammy Faye Baker and uh, Jerry Falwell and Jimmy Swagger. And I was raised in a in a church where people would say things like, "Oh, the devil's working on Jim Baker at me." And even when I was nine years old, I thought, "Nah, he's probably just a jerk." You know, I doubt I doubt the devil snuck, snuck into Tika K and raised Jim Baker's windowsill one night and said, "Take all the money," and then closed it and crept back into the woods. You know, waiting for Young Goodman Brown to come wandering down the path. Um, so I was always really interested in that. And then my second novel set in the 1990s, uh, which was a time of, to my mind, the 1998 home run race was the last time the country was all united around something positive, and which is a shame because that was 20 years ago uh, this summer. Um, so, you know, when you're writing a historical novel, you can get lost in the details that you're trying to, trying to get right. So, for example, one day I just spent all day trying to figure out what kind of shoes Ella would have and I just thought, why am I doing this? I'm just going to say she cinched the straps on her shoes. She would have worn shoes that had some kind of buckle on them to keep them on her feet. I'm just going to say that. Um, but what I like about historical fiction, actually, I, I, I spoke at a the Southern Labor Studies Conference in Athens, Georgia. Um, and I spoke about the last ballad. So I'm there with all these academics from really fantastic teaching, have degrees from really fantastic schools. And here I am, this fiction writer going into the Den of Lions because it's the labor studies conference and the Lore strike is, you know, like the all-star game of, of labor conference discussions. And so I'm in this room similar to this and I'm talking about my novel and I'm getting some kind of testiness from some of the, some of the scholars in the audience. And we finally agreed that people read history to see what happened and people read fiction to see what it felt like. And that's what I really was concerned with with The Last Ballad is I want this novel to feel rich I want it to feel uh, environmental, which is to say atmospheric. And what I really tried to do was I started out with a set of facts. I know for certain on June 6th there was a raid on Stryker's headquarters. There were two off-duty police officers there who were part of the raid. That's fact. What's also fact is that they spent that day at a Confederate rally in Charlotte. There were 150,000 people in Charlotte celebrating the Confederacy. So these guys spent all day in Charlotte drinking illegal whiskey. One of them had been suspended for drinking on the job and abusing a black child. They were both armed. They were off duty. And then they go back to Gastonia. They go drink more liquor. Then they decide to go down to a quiet tent colony where women and minorities are uh, protesting higher wages against a white-owned mill. So why would these two off-duty police officers, both of them armed, one of them suspended, drunk after spending all day at a Confederate rally, what's going to make them go down to a union headquarters and demand to be let inside without being called? So those are the facts. But with fiction, I can say, I bet I know what made them do it. Same thing that made people head up to Charlottesville and drive a, drive a car and, 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 and to protesters and murder a woman, and he was just found guilty. Um, so that's kind of the push and pull of history. We look at a set of facts, and it's just like going into a courtroom. We say, what is, what is the understory of these facts? How can I tie these facts together and discern some level of intent? So what made Ella, a woman, uh, walk off her job 
and, and join a protest. You know, what, what would make her do that? Probably not a sense of adventure. Probably desperation. So I leaned into that desperation when I was writing about her. To give the readers a sense of what it felt like to experience it, right? Sure. But uh, to your point about Charlottesville, your novel in many ways responds to, to right now to the world in which it was written, to the world in which it was published. You have, as, as we've discussed once before, a strong-willed independent woman who uh, is all about inclusion, all about bringing people together, a unifier in some ways. That's, that's not her natural state, but it's what she becomes in response to the world she's in. And she's rallying against corporate greed and you're writing this in 2016, an election year, when that sort of seemed very familiar to a lot of people. Sure. Uh, would you speak to that a little bit? Sure, you know, I think, you know, this is not to say my book that I'm necessarily doing this, but I, I like to think that, that literature is written about a time, but hopefully it's written for all time, that we can, we can pick up a work, no matter whether it's like in the canon or not, but we can pick up a work and say, I know this is written about 1850, but how can I extrapolate some kind of, some kind of contemporary value from what, I'm, from what I'm reading and how can I apply it today? And so I certainly wasn't writing Last Ballad in a vacuum, um, and nor do I think it can be read in a vacuum. Um, but to your point, you know, there's a lot of similarities between 1929 and 2016 or 2017 or 2018. And the Charlottesville is a good example. You know, there's, there's this, 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 this thing led by white supremacy. There was a lot of white supremacist attitudes in the mill strike. The, uh, there was a committee of 100 taking out uh, advertisements in the local newspaper talking about, do you know the unions here to make sure your kids go to school with black kids? How are you going to allow that? What are you going to do? Do you know that this union here is to kill you and take all your personal property? What are you going to do, Americans? Now is time for every real American to do his duty. And so we have a lot of the same language going on at, at, both, at, at both places and both times. And people have asked me, you know, how does, it, how does it feel to see history repeat itself? And I always say, it's not repeating itself. It's a straight line. To repeat shows some kind of correction. To repeat shows some kind of fullness, some kind of completion. We've never had that fullness. We've never had that completion. We've just shot a straight line from 1929, and the calendar year has just changed, and now it's 2018. And we still see a lot of the same things happening. Jason, you are not burdened with facts the way that Wiley is, but I'm really curious to know, uh, as a writer of speculative fiction, how do you sort of set up the framework to that? Do you say, it's exactly the real world except for these three things are different, and let's see what happens, or do you take a different approach to it? Well, I mean, I, uh, even though it's fiction, I feel like I am still burdened with facts to a, point, to a certain point. Um, because you know, speculative fiction tries to take, you know, it, take, it does take, you know, it takes the world, it changes one or two or three small things about it, but then from that point forward, you want to have people's reactions and people's behavior be as close to real as you can actually get. Um, and so in that sense, like the story, you know, my stories are all very much informed by things that I see in the real world and the behavior of that. Um, a lot of what drives the character motivations in The Crossing is that um, Tommy and Virginia's father, you know, he, he saw the Challenger shuttle disaster as I saw the shuttle, you know, Challenger shuttle disaster. And that becomes one of the defining moments that drives him forward and eventually drives the character forward. They, you know, eventually weaves into Virginia's love and desire to go see the Canaveral launch because she learned from her father how much he used to, you know, he was in love with, you know, space exploration, things of that matter. And the, you know, the Challenger shuttle launch traumatized him. That's because the Challenger shuttle launch traumatized me. Like, I, I still vividly remember sitting in class. They rolled the projector in, we sat there, we watched, and me and all my classmates sat there and everyone was excited because there was a teacher in this one. It was just so, it was, and we watch, and the shuttle launches. And there was this heinous explosion, and none of us, the kids, none of us knew what happened. Like we just kind of, we sat there like really confused and like not quite stunned. We didn't even know to be stunned. Yeah. It was just such a surreal moment. We sat there, and then after maybe 10, 15 seconds, one of the teachers began crying, and that was like the indication to all the kids. And then like you know, five seconds later, all the kids were sobbing. Now, and we still don't really know what happened. We just know it's bad because the teacher. Out there, um, and so all of those facts inform the story that I, I try to write, um, and they they bleed into you know the political climate. Like I said, you know, it is very much rooted in the political climate of the time of the writing, which is in 2016, I think it was 2016, 2017. Um, but even before that, you know, um, as Wally said, you know, it's American history is essentially a straight line. Like I've existed, I'm 40 years old now, so I've got 40 years of extensive research in American history as being an American citizen here um, and living here, and 
you know, and all of that bleeds into my work. Um, it comes in in very different and unexpected ways oftentimes. Um, you know, people oftentimes, the question I get asked a lot, and I think it's because, you know, obviously I'm a writer of color. Um, and so, and I say that with that downtone kind of, you know, remark because of the fact that typically when you're a writer of color, you're expected to write about, you know, characters of color. And there's like this unwritten rule that if you're a writer of color, your story has to be about race in some way. Um, and I would kind of counter that and always say that, like, you know, if you live in America and you write anything, you're writing about some degree of race. Like, Americans are very, there's a lot of racial history and racial issues in America. Um, and thus far, like, I've written characters from the point of view of, you know, white characters. I've written, you know, um, African American characters. I've written Asian characters. I've written Hispanic characters. Like, I have a pretty colorful group of friends, and, they, and they're all Americans. Like, they reflect this America as much as any other one body person type. Um, and so all of that, you know, that real world stuff, like it, you know, you can't write fiction without having one foot in the real world. Like, you know, even if you're doing Lord of the Rings or something, you know, you've got the real world bleeding into it, whether you want it to or not, and that becomes a part of what you're writing. Um, so it, it's always there. Like, it, and I'm, you know, I'm a science nerd, a bit of a history nerd, like language nerd. Like, the real world is always knocking at the door. I just, I, you know, mask it in something and slide it in, and people don't recognize it oftentimes until you start picking it apart. It's that authenticity that we've talked about a couple sure. times up here, too. And I was thinking when, when I was driving down here today, I actually ran out of gas uh, <laughs> on the way here. Um, and uh, my mom got me AAA for Christmas. She's like, you drive a lot. I'm going to get you AAA. And I thought, oh, that's the worst present ever. <laughs> I'd rather just not have anything. So I'm sitting there on the on I-95, and I'm thinking, oh, I guess I'm going to walk in the rain to whatever gas station is around. And I thought, Mom got me AAA. <laughs> so like 30 minutes later, I'm cruising down the highway. Like, thank you, Mom. Um, but I was thinking about Jason, and I was thinking about Jason's work, how he's able to establish the real world, the world that we know. And he presents that real world, and then there's like a moment where it just goes, and it's just a, there's a little bit of a slant. There's a little bit of a, of a newness or, it's, or speculation or some, some kind of some kind of uh, instability or destabilizing thing, the reader just goes, oh, okay, so that's happening. So we're doing that. And I think that's, that presents a particular challenge where you are balancing the world that we know and then the world Jason's created. And so he's got these two rules. I've just got the world that I know. Like, I'm just writing about it. I might look outside. I'm like, yep, yeah, grass is still green. You know, I'm <laughs> typing about green grass. And I, I teach. I'm writing residence at UNCA, and my students there – I, there's, there's been a couple times when I've thought about you because they'll, they'll say, you know, if you were familiar with this comic, you would know that what we're reading is this. And I, I've told them several times, like, I apologize. Like, I'm not, I'm not coming here with the knowledge that I should have based on the interest that you're clearly showing me in so many ways. And so that they're interested in a lot of speculative stuff because it's just – I don't even think it's the literary trend. I feel like it's almost the cultural trend that we're leading ourselves in that way, like toward this almost speculative absurdity. Yeah, I think so. Like, for those of you who don't know, I'm a huge comic book nerd. Um, I have been for a long time. Uh, but even I'm getting tired of superhero movies, I will say. That. I'm like, so tired of superhero movies. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there is a, there's an air of escapism right now. And I think it reflects the amount of fear that we all have and like, the fact that we're, we're really un- – we, really, we all feel very uncertain and very destabilized and very unsure of what is happening in the world around us. I think it's all changing really rapidly right now, and the speed of the change is only occurring faster and faster and faster. And I feel like that's been, that's been part of like Speculative fiction has always been there, um, but it is in a boom time right now, which is good for me as a writer of speculative fiction. Um, but it also is very disturbing to me. Like Again, I love superheroes and like that whole world, but the whole point of that was to be a bit of escapism. I mean, there are lessons in morals, and there, you know, I can I can spend five hours talking about like the merits of, of superheroes and how it connects to mythology, and like I can really go off way too long about it. But the the summation of it is the fact that like it was never intended to replace our interaction with the real world and our interaction with other types of stories. It was just meant to be a part of that landscape. And now you know Star Wars, you know superheroes, like they've all become you know this. You know, they've all, they're, they're the contemporary mythology that we all share, and that's positive. But I find it really unsettling the degree to which we are leaning into that escape. Like we, we do, we're all desiring escape, escape so desperately now that it really unsettles me because the more you escape, the more that the real world is slipping away and we're not engaging with the real world in ways that we should be, in my opinion. Um, 
And so I don't know. I think, you know, I, again, I love speculative fiction. I always have and I always will and always my, my first love. But there, you know, the I'm really unsettled by the amount of, you know, in the media, the amount of speculative fiction and like the amount, the amount that we escape. We are escaping too much right now. Um, and that doesn't mean don't go buy my book, because please, go buy my book. <laughs> escape into that. Um, but I, 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 I think that historical fiction, there's, we need more of that um, to go along with the escapism. You know, we need to be have one foot in the real world and one foot in the escapist world. And I think right now there's a, a weird balance. I think it's because of fear. Like we're there are a lot of really frightened people right now. And so it's like, well, I'm, I'm afraid of the real world, so I'm just going to go over here and escape into you know superheroes for a while. And that I think is dangerous in the long term. Mark, I think it's interesting how those those fears, like especially in film, like. In the 80s, the villains always had Russian accents. Yeah. And in the 90s, the villain was always like inside the computer, this unseen digital. Yeah. And then, and then like post 2005 or so, it's been all apocalyptic. It's all like the end of the world's coming, Hunger Games, mm-hmm. uh, Radio Player One, was it Player yeah. One? It's all nostalgia. Sure, sure, yeah. The whole movie of nostalgia. Sure, yeah. Like, like the end of the world is coming, uh, or, or has come, you know. Yeah, and this, this thing, like, it always, you know, it's speculative fiction, like, you know, I'm going to give a brief comic book lesson here. Um, but comic books have always re- you know, reflected the fears of society at the time. If you go back to you know, the, the earliest groups of comics for superheroes was the, event, the adventure tales. You know, people went off to South America and fought pirates and you know, all kind of weird people and came back and brought back treasure, which was this fear of you know, this kind of you know, um, um, just fear of other people and other places. I can't think of the word right now. I'm freaking out on it. Um, but there was this fear of, of not aliens, but foreign foreign people. And so the adventure became going off to foreign lands and making it back alive and fighting off, you know, tribesmen and all those kinds of things. And then, you know, superheroes came about and reflect in, in a response to World War One and like the, the sense of powerlessness and like the horrors that were reflected in World War One gave rise to Superman and later Batman and all those kinds of characters. And they were, you know, fighting Nazis. Like Captain America, the first issue of Captain America, the cover has Captain America punching Adolf Hitler. Like, he, superheroes were there to say, hey, you know, we're afraid of the Germans, so let's talk about that in this form of, you know, this medium here. And then you get into the 60s and you get, you know, the Incredible Hulk, you get Spider-Man, you get the Fantastic Four. The thing they all have in common is they were all irradiated. We were afraid of the nuclear bomb. We were afraid of radiation. And so you get superheroes that are now, you know, irradiated and they, they're talking about our fears of like, the atomic bomb. You get to the 70s and you get these really rough anti-heroes like the Punisher and Wolverine and these characters – were ones who had broken, you know, this was post-Vietnam. And this was a case where, like, this was post-Vietnam, this is an era when we watched Nixon, you know, get impeached, we watched the president fall. Like, we were afraid of government, we were, we were completely destabilized as a society, so our heroes became equally destabilized. Like, the Punisher, people don't know, like, he's a Vietnam veteran. Like, Punisher was, you know, there's a great quote in uh, one of the most uh, contemporary comics, and it says, Captain America is what happens after World War I, the Punisher is what happens after Vietnam, and that talks about the U.S. and how we change our view of wars and veterans and all those things. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're seeing that same thing now. Like, right now, the fears we're, that we're writing about are plagues, diseases, environmental things, um, you know, a lot of small things that fears are, 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 we're afraid of right now. But it comes through in the writing. Like, we're all afraid of this apocalyptic end, which I totally wrote about. You should totally buy the book. Um, but it's, you know... It's true, like those, the mediums of escapism have always reflected our fears. Um, so it's, just, it's really interesting to chart all of that sometimes. This is now my favorite visiting writer series. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Beth Ann Fenley, if you're watching this at all. This is, this is it. This is now my new favorite. So let's go from talking about things that are ending to talking about something that is beginning. And then after that, we'll open it up for questions. Because I want to give Wiley a chance to talk about Open Canon Book Club and how that came about and what you're doing and how, how folks can participate. Sure, so <clears throat> Open Canon came about because um, I've visited a lot of book clubs over the past um, several years, and uh, a lot of the book clubs that I visit are people, my mom's gonna eventually watch this, my mom knows Jason. My mom is obsessed with Jason. Uh, my, dad awesome. passed, my dad passed away a couple of years ago. My dad liked Jason uh, because he liked cars, and my mom likes Jason because he's Jason. Uh, but my mom's sick, she couldn't come with me, uh, so she'll probably watch this because I'm on stage with you. Um, but when I visit book clubs, it's, it's a lot of people like my mom, and I remind them of their son, or their son-in-law, or uh, maybe their husband, and they say, you know, we, we read a lot, 
or if I meet somebody in the bookstore, I, I read a lot. I, I just read everything. I read Martin Rash. I read Charles Frazier. I read David Joy, big Pat Conroy fan, um, Tom Franklin. And you begin, kind of begin to see a theme. It's like you read people who either are, are me or I will one day look like. <laughs> and I started thinking, you know, what if when I go to a book club, if I'm able to take a book by a writer like Krista Wilkinson, an African-American woman who grew up in the Appalachian Mountains of Kentucky, who wrote a beautiful novel called uh, The Birds of Opulence. Like, what if instead of saying, um, oh, you've read Cold Mountain, great, you like Appalachian literature, what about Krista Wilkinson? She's an Appalachian writer, too. Maybe they've never heard of Krista Wilkinson. And so one day I was with my wife, and I said, I think I'm going to start an online book club. And she just thought, oh, God, that's a terrible idea. It's similar to last night I ironed this shirt, and I said, I'm going to wear this shirt and this blazer with these jeans, and she said, that, that doesn't match. And then I, as I got out of the car and I was walking in here today, I thought, this doesn't match at all. That was my first thought. Yeah, this, this, this does not match. I should not have worn this. Uh, but the book club I will stand by is a good idea. And so uh, I started this book club, and, and the goal of the book club, I can't remember the exact language that's on the website, is to uh, introduce readers to experiences, uh, to diversions of the American experience they may not otherwise uh, encounter in their daily lives or their book clubs or their work. Because um, I believe uh, that diversity is the hinge on which democracy swings. And uh, so I want to introduce people to as broad as voices. Um, but Krista Wilkinson, I'm not doing it for the author's sake. Like most of these authors sell more books than I do considerably. Like uh, uh, Luis Alberto Urea, he was our second book club selection. Like he's a National Book Award finalist. He doesn't need me to help him sell books. But maybe out there needs to read, someone needs to read uh, Into the Beautiful North, which is a border novel. And so if you join the Open Canada Book Club, every month you get a couple of emails from me. I list discussion questions, uh, interviews with the author, photo essays, different projects like that. Sometimes I'll include companion reads, like if you like our book club selection, maybe you'll also like this book. Um, so it's been a blast so far. We've got about 2,000 members. Garden Gun wrote about uh, the book club in a profile. So it's got, it's got some attention. And it's fun that I'll go do my own events and someone will say, I'm a member of Open Canon Book Club. I haven't read your book yet, but I read The Birds of Opulence. And I'll think like, well, great, but you're going to buy my book, right? And it's not a totally selfless project. But, um, but it's, been, it's been an absolute blast. And the authors always come in and take over the Facebook page and take questions from readers one night during the month selection. And, and sometimes I'll do a live book club chat. And, uh, and so it's, it's been a lot of fun doing it. Definitely taken on a life of its own. Yeah. I had no idea there were 2,000 people yeah. involved already. That's incredible. Yeah. Congratulations on that. That's terrific. Yeah. It's been fun. When are you going to start a book club, Jason? I don't know. Actually, I, I, or a car I'm club. not reading. Yeah, a car club would be awesome. I would love to start a car club. Um, I'm a huge car guy. Um, yeah, I need to start a book club. It's funny, like, um, Wally and I have a really wacky backstory of how we met. Um, and I think I'm going to take a quick second to try to give you the short version of it. Um, so when The Return came out, I went on this really long book tour. It was like six weeks, which is horrible. I have a horrible flashback from it. Anyhow, um, I was traveling like all around the country for six whole weeks. And consistently, I would go into bookstores and meet the booksellers before the reading. Like, hey, how's it going? And we're just introducing. I was like, yeah, I'm from North Carolina. And they're like, oh, man, I just had an author from North Carolina come through here. His name's um, um, Wiley. Wiley's Wiley Cash. It's like, oh, okay, cool. I had never heard of Wiley, never met him, knew nothing about him. Um, so then, you know, the next week I'm at another bookstore. It's like, oh, yeah, this guy, from, what, you do, do you know Wiley Cash? He just came through here from North Carolina, too. It's like, nope, don't know him. This goes on for, you know, the entire book tour. <laughs> um, and I, I kid you not, and so I finally, my, I come home to North Carolina for my final reading of the book tour. Um, this wonderful lady comes up to me, and she buys my book, and she's talking about how she read the book, and she loved it. And she goes, yeah, my son's a writer, too. I'm like, oh, cool. And she's like, yeah, his name is Wiley. He writes a lot of books. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, have not met him, but I've heard wonderful things about him. And so still, you know, that, so that happens. And then you go forward, like, again, like, you know, eight, nine more months later, I go on my paperback book tour for The Return. And I'm going around, and people are like, oh, man, this guy named Wiley Cash just came through here. Do you know him? It's like, nope, don't know him, but, you know, I've heard so much about him. I know his mom. <laughs> um, so this goes on for almost a full year of, like, just consistently trailing behind this mysterious guy named Wiley Cash who was going everywhere I was, you know, I was going. Um, so finally, you know, I find him on Facebook through his mom, because his mom and I are Facebook friends. So I'm like, oh, it's just, you know, Facebook friend him. 
So I friend him, and so one day I decided, I was like, you know, I, we had missed each other like so, so many times. So let me just contact him. So I Facebook message him, and I say, you know, um, I say, hey, you know, I you know, don't know you, don't have met you. I know you live here in town somewhere. Let's get together and have a burger. Like, I keep hearing about you. I've met your mom multiple times now. She's awesome. <laughs> like, you know, let's, let's, ha- you know, let's have a burger sometimes. So I, I type this message. I hit send as I'm going to the airport to fly off to another book tour. Um, I literally drive to the airport. I buy my plane ticket. I'm sitting in the airport in Wilmington. This guy comes up to me and taps me on the leg. He goes, hey, are you Jason Mott? I was like, yeah. He goes, I'm Wiley Cash. <laughs> he was flying out somewhere the exact same day. Um, so since then, we've been you know, hanging out. But it's, it, it was like a year in the making before I finally met the mysterious Wiley Cash. And that happens a lot. I mean, you know, you, 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 you have a book. You always remember, like, your book class. Like, yeah. who's got a book yeah. out roughly the same time you do? And you're always going on tour, especially being from the South, being from North Carolina. You're always either in somebody's footsteps, or you're their warm-up act, or you're, you know, the the uh, the closer, whatever. Or you end up at a festival at the same time. You end up at a festival at the same time. We were in South Carolina yeah. uh, in 2014. Yeah. At the same time, so we hung out there, and we did. My wife, my wife's a photographer, and we have a, a, a monthly column in a several North Carolina magazines called Drinking with Writers, and Jason was the first one we profiled. Yeah. We go go have beers or coffee with the writer and kind of hang out. Out. she <laughs> takes pictures. It, it, is, it is kind of fun. Um, but yeah, speaking of moms and, and, and writers, I was in Shelby, North Carolina for an event and uh, several years ago, and I was there probably in March, and, and Ron Rash was going to be there. He's from that area. And like a few weeks after me, and I said, my name's Wiley Cash, I'm Ron Rash's opening act. Uh, and I talked about how I was the acoustic band nobody had ever heard of. <laughs> Pink Floyd will be here next. Pink Floyd will be taking the stage. And after the event, this, this older woman came up to me and she said, oh, I just wanted to say, hey, I'm Ron's mom. <laughs> and I said, and I swear, I said, Ron who? <laughs> she said, Ron Rash. And I said, you came to see me? <laughs> Yeah, moms are always out there. Absolutely, they are. I hope we got a few watching. Uh, but let's take this as our transition to see what questions our audience might have. Who's got a good question for Wiley or for Jason or for both of them? Lynn's got a question. I have a question for both of you because you have so many good things to say about the writing process and diversity, um, and you know so much about the comics and the history. Have you ever thought about doing this sort of thing in a high school? Because I could take these books home, and because it's mom, no one is interested. Sure. But they hear things from the actual authors, and they love dystopian novels anyway. I've spoken at several high schools. Uh, I don't have, like, a high school program that I'm, like, pitching. Um, But I've spoken at at a good many high schools. Like, if I do a community read, then a community adopts one of my books, like my first novel, Landmark Khan. That was adopted by a couple of communities intermittently, and I go to high schools and talk to students, and they're all forced to read it. Or they're, they're, they're all supposed to have read it. <laughs> the two of you. Yeah. Two of us together? Yeah, we could, that, that would be, that would be yeah, fun. That would be awesome, actually. That, that would be fun. Yeah. You have yeah. a road show going on. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you do the drive, and I'll pay for the gas. Fair enough. No. Yeah. Uh, I gotta let you have triple A. I do have triple A. I gotta let you later in your whole game. Yeah. Like, my, when, I was, when I was growing up as a teenager, it's funny, because like, like, I'm really OCD about not running out of gas. Because when I was a teenager, I got my very first car. The thing my father told me, he goes, he goes, no matter what happens, I will come and pick you up unless you run out of gas. Because that you could have prevented. Anything else that happens in your car, I'll come get you. Just if you run out of gas, don't call me. Call someone else. And so now I got to let you go that thing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it, high schools are always a rich area to talk about the act of writing and, and the role of writing in your life because, you know, I grew up wanting to be a writer, uh, not for, for totally justifiable reasons. I listened to The Doors, right? I thought Jim Morrison was the greatest poet of all time. Girls liked him. I wanted girls to like me. I just thought, like, I'll, be, I'll just be a poet like Jim Morrison. And then I went to college, realized I was a terrible poet, but I still liked writing, so I began writing fiction. And, and, and I think a lot of young people start writing because they think it's a path to um, understanding themselves or connecting with another person or connecting with music, perhaps. And so it is interesting to be around young people, college freshmen, high school age students, and kind of foster that, that interest. But I love talking to high school students. Yeah, I think it would be good to actually, like, while I did that, we may have to actually talk about that a little sure. bit. That would be fun. Because um, yeah, I think he and I reflect, you know, we're, we're very similar. Like, we have very similar backstories, like the course of our lives and, like, career charting. Like, it's almost, you know, even, like, kids and stuff. Like, you know, we're running very parallel. It's kind of freaky sometimes. 
Um, and yet we also, you know, we come from very different sides of what America is, and like, you know, we have very different narratives about your know, writing and all those kinds of things. You know, we work in different areas. Um, so we could, I think we do complement each other pretty well. We both wear boots. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I think it's a good, really good idea, actually. Good idea, Lynn. Thank you. Was there another hand that went up? Oh, two. Uh, and we'll start there, and then we'll get to you. Um, Wiley, do you are any of the other characters in your book um, real? Were they really in LMA's story? Or they um, so, are any of the characters in the book real? Um, the McAdams are based on a family, uh, the McAdam family, that started a mill town called McAdamville. Mm -hmm. uh, but that couple is not that couple. I kind of, I just want to change their name. They were not similar to that couple at all. Uh, but it's based on a real family in a real, in a real town. Percy Epps, uh, who was kind of the bruiser of the mill, the attorney who ran the uh, security, he was based on a real person. Um, Fred Beal was the real strike leader. That was his name. Um, Sophie Blevin was based on, a, on an organizer named Sophia Melvin. Um, there were a couple of other people. Most of the names I changed, if I changed a lot about them. Uh, Hampton Haywood was based on a real person. He was an African-American organizer sent south who had a, who had a southern tie. Um, the evangelist, the brother is obsessed. Yeah, Amy Simple McPherson was a real person. She actually sold chairs like the one brother has to raise money for her temple. Asked you to pray for the person who was sitting in the chair, and she would send you a miniature chair. Um, so a lot of that stuff was real, but you know, Virgil and his wife down in Cowpens, they weren't real. I made them up. Um, so maybe half real and half not real. The the uh, the brothers who own American Mill Number Two were real. Their story's real. The two brothers, the Goldbergs. And one more question. Um, are any of her children still living? Are you in contact? No, I know her great-granddaughter, a woman named Christina Horton. She wrote a book about Ella called Martyr of the Lorraine Mill Strike. She lives up in Asheville. Um, I've met her several times. Uh, her, grand, her grandson, Victor, I think Victor was the son of Ella's youngest daughter, Millie. He just passed away maybe six months ago. I, I met him before he passed away. Um, but yeah, her, her, her great granddaughter, Christine is pretty tough. And I, I purposely stayed away from the family when I was working on the book because I didn't want to have anecdotal stuff because I knew I didn't want Ella to be a saint because she wasn't a saint. She was tough. She was hard scrabble. She was independent. And I wanted to kind of project the vision that I had of her based on the materials that I was finding and not anecdotal stories that have been passed down. But we had the release for the book at, at, uh, in Asheville on UNC Asheville's campus. And I got an, uh, a Facebook message from Christina that just said, see you in Asheville. And I thought, to kill me? Like, what, <laughs> what does that mean? And then, uh, and so we got there, and it was in this huge auditorium, and uh, the lights were really bright. And I said, I understand that Ella's great-granddaughter, Christina, is here tonight. And, 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 and I just kind of saw like a shadowy figure stand up, and I thought, oh, please sit back down. And she said that. And then I met her, and she's wonderful. She's absolutely wonderful. Um, but I was in Asheville uh, for the hurricane. We fled Florence and went up to Asheville and stayed up there for several days. And uh, Shannon, who was, was actually recording Ella's song for the Oxford American, she texted me and she said, I'm about to go to the studio in Asheville and record Ella's song. And I said, well, I'm in Asheville. Can I come see you record it? And so I got to go see her record uh, Ella's music for the album. And then from there, I went to Malaprops, which is the bookstore uh, in Asheville uh, with my daughter. We were walking back to the place where we were staying, and I turned a corner, and there was a poster on uh, a lamppost, and it was a picture of Ella, and it said, who killed Ella May? Mm -hmm. And then it said, for tips, please call this number. And I, I called the number, and it was the Gaston County Sheriff's Department. I have no idea who put it up, but I emailed Christine, and I said, did you, I sent her a picture, and I said, did you put this up? She said, no. She said, did you, did you put it up? I said, no. I didn't put it up. So it was just this weird, like, Ella weekend. Like, I saw the, the song recorded and immediately saw a poster mm -hmm. asking for information on her murder. It was just a strange, strange moment. That is incredible. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary, I think you had a question, too. So what are y'all working on next? I think readers are greedy of, like, okay, we finished that. We want, <laughs> we want yeah. more. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, my, I'm very, very, my, I'm working on a book about a writer on book tour. Um, I've like every writer I know is going to clamor to blurb. Who runs like, I put my name on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've talked to I've, I've talked to Wiley about it. My 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 agent and I have been seesawing back and forth on it literally for years. Um, 
Because after, so when the return came out, I was on the you know, six week book tour and it was the wackiest, weirdest, strangest, surrealist, and most emotionally charged. Like it was, a, it was an experience that I could, it's hard to even talk about. Well, it's not too hard, but it's, it's, it's a very weird experience. Like, um, and it's rooted in the sense that, so the return of, you know, if, if you haven't read the book, is about this event in which people who have passed away have suddenly begun coming back and trying to re-enter their lives and left behind. Like, there's no zombie action, nobody's getting eaten brains, or like, they're just trying, <clears throat> people just come back trying to get back and reconnect with, like, you know, parents and loved ones, and, like, it's about being, you know, connected with people that you lost. So that's rooted in the fact that, you know, my mother passed in 2000, 2001, and in 2010, before I, you know, before I wrote the book or anything, I had this really vivid dream that I come from work and found her sitting at the kitchen table waiting for me. And so I sat and talked with her about all the things that had happened in the years that are passing. So you fast forward a bit, I write a novel that kind of talks about that. It's my way of you know, being cathartic and getting it all out. Um, and then I get put on this book tour where, you know, book tours are wacky, you're in a new city every night, you meet new people, like it's just so strange and weird. But the, you know, as, every, as with everything in life, there's a catch that comes with everything. And this is the thing nobody told me going in. The catch for me emotionally was the fact that, you know, I got, you know, this success and all this wonderful stuff that happened. But the bad part about it was I had to recount all these painful things about my mother's passing and the fact that, you know, I, you know, that this book couldn't have existed if she hadn't died. Like, there's this really, really hard kind of, you know, synthesis there that kind of emerged. And so I wound up having to, like, deal with that every week. It, it wore me out. Um, in addition to being, like, run ragged by publishers, there's a part where I pass out on a plane, like, this is a true story. Like, I literally... And I don't mean like I took a nap on the plane, like I literally fell out unconscious in the aisle on the plane from exhaustion. Um, and so that, you know, that's, it's, and it sounds terrifying, but it was actually, it was terrifying at the time, but funny like five minutes after. Like I was completely giggling. <laughs> He's got a pulse and everybody burst Yeah, exactly, out. exactly. Um, you want to, the, the thing I learned though, if you're on a book tour and you pass out on a plane, when you wake up, you wind up having to pitch your book all over again. Um, so, so I want to write, I've been wanting for years to write a novel about this, a novel slash memoir about it. Um, and I think I was talking to my agent this weekend, and I've kind of gotten the green light to finally pursue it. Um, and the thing she doesn't know is like, it's almost, it's like 75% done already, so I've been working on it for a while now. Um, so that's hopefully my next project. You know, we've got to talk to the publisher and get things worked out there, but like, it is the book that I've been dying to write. It's, obviously it's a comedy, because it's such a, being on book tour is such an insane thing that I think readers will love to hear about it, because Weird things happen in weird places on book tour. <laughs> uh, my, it's funny, if you go out in the lobby, you see my photo, like my author photo. Those are not my clothes that I'm wearing in that photo. Um, there's someone else's clothes I was forced to wear for that photo shoot. Like, those are the photographer's clothes that I'm wearing in that photo shoot. Weird things like that happen when you're an author on book tour. Um, I'm, I'm kind of working on a new novel. I'm way behind uh, deadline as usual. Um, but I don't really know where it's going or what it's going to be or even what it's going to be about. It's right now it's set in uh, 1980, but it may end up be set, being set years earlier. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what it is right now. But I'm doing a lot of nonfiction writing. My wife, as I said, is a photographer, so she and I are partnering together on as much stuff as we can, otherwise we wouldn't see each other. Um, so one thing that we just finished, uh, there was an event in Wilmington in 1898 it was the only successful coup in American history where these former Confederates overthrew the government and kind of, which was, it was a predominantly black town, and they overthrew the government and ran people out of town, ran them out of their homes, and literally overtook the town. And the governor refused to call in the National Guard, and it totally shifted the, fu the future of that city and the fate of the city. And it's only been in the past 15 years that people have been talking about it. And there's a writer named John Jeremiah Sullivan, who's a nonfiction writer who lives in Wilmington, and Rhiannon Giddens, who is from Carolina Chocolate Drops, African-American uh, old-time band. They just recently did a performance on the music of 1898 to say, you know, here's the music of the time, and here's what's kind of happened during this coup, and here's the implications of all of these things. And so my wife went and photographed it, and I'm writing this long essay about their performance. Um, we're also working on a project on the, on the monuments centered around um, Silent Sam and Chapel Hill, the monument that came down in Chapel Hill, and the monuments in North Carolina, and what happened the day they were put up. Like, we all know when Silent Sam came down, it was like on national news, and it's a bunch of undergraduates with cell phones, you know, and all this stuff. But like, what do we know about the day it was put up? What do we know about the day the monuments were put up in Wilmington? Who was there? Who marched? What, what, what things were said? And so we're working on that. Um, we're doing the, the article about uh, drinking with writers, 
and uh, just a couple of other things like that. So I'm basically working on everything except what I'm getting paid to work on. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of stuff for free, which is good for both your marriage and your uh, financial stability. Um, but I, I, I just, I'm, I'm just kind of at a point where um, I feel like I can always be writing about something, and I'm trying to work on short stories too. Uh, it may not be the thing I'm under contract to do, but I'm trying to write toward the passion of the moment and what interests me, because I think that I'm a capable enough manager now to not feel that I necessarily have to just do one thing. Like, I know Jason does a million things. He's writing scripts, he's pitching, he's writing books, and I'm trying to kind of lean in that direction as well, and I'm teaching too, as is Jason. Oh, that was my other question. A land more kind than home has been optioned? Uh, I just was optioned uh, a few weeks ago for the first time, yeah. And that just means that someone bought the rights to one day maybe make a movie <laughs> if they can Thank find God. money. Okay. Jason, I, I put that on, on Facebook, and Jason texted me and said, details, what are the details? And I said, man, it's a small production company. It's, I know, I, it's, there's no way it's going to get made. If it does get made, I'm probably going to have to star in it <laughs> and for free. But I, I, I texted Jason and I said, by the way, do you know Ryan Gosling or Ryan Reynolds? <laughs> and Jason said, I know Ryan from Bojangles. And I said, is he handsome? <laughs> have him send me his audition tape because he may be able to be cast in the lead as Link for that more kind of but, um, Somewhere Ryan is wearing photographer's clothing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right now. Um, so this is the first time it's been optioned. So uh, I'm supposed to talk to the guy who, who optioned it next week. So we'll see. Maybe it'd be a nice surprise. Good. Fingers crossed. Uh, was that our last question or was there one more? Aim? I think that might be it. Well, you've gotten to learn a lot about what's in your distant future with the projects they're working on. I can tell you what's in your immediate future, and that's the opportunity to buy the books they have, we've been talking about in this room. Thanks to never more books, these folks will be signing in the lobby out front. I want to thank Wiley and Jason for being with us, and I want to thank all of you for showing up as well. Thank you, thank so, you, much. you all so much. On Absolutely. this cold, rainy day. Thank you.